Welcome to the DFO Rundown Podcast with Frank Saravalli and Jason Greger on dailyfaceoff.com. Delivered by DoorDash. Welcome to episode 146 of the DFO Rundown. It's the, the recap of the free agent frenzy, which isn't officially over yet. There's lots of uh, good players still available as we were recording this on uh, Wednesday evening at uh, 8.30 Eastern, 6.30 Mountain Time. I'm Jason Greger. He's Frank Saravalli. And uh, this episode is brought to you by Three Ice Overtime All the Time, led by six Hall of Famers in uh, Brian Trotche, Joe Mullen, John LeClaire, Larry Murphy, Grant Fear, and uh, Guy Carbono. Three Ice is currently ongoing right now, eight cities over nine weeks. They got stops in uh, London, Ontario coming up uh, this weekend, and then in Quebec City on July. 30th get your tickets at 3ice.com that's the number 3ice.com and uh Frank a crazy day in free agency is uh, always happens and uh, we had to wait a little bit longer but uh, Johnny Gaudreau who was one of the uh, the big names on the free agent board the biggest name surprises a lot of people and goes to Columbus baby he's not going to have to be scared of the uh cannon anymore he'll be prepared for it there are jaws on the floor from Alberta all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, I can't tell you one person who whispered this, thought that this was a possibility or likely put two and two together. Um, I think there was always the idea that there might be a mystery team out there. Um, I actually included it in my story that was posted at eight o'clock this morning. I said, flyers, Islanders, devils, or a mystery team didn't know who it was. And I thought, even if they were to get in the mix that because of all the things that we had heard about Johnny Gaudreau and the narrative wanting to be closer to home, doesn't sign in Calgary because it's a family decision that there was really no chance. So let's walk through this Gaudreau decision and I've never been more excited and or interested to hear a player explain his choice and decision so he takes less money somewhere between I don't know 15 to 17 million dollars less the offer on the table on good authority 10 and a half times eight in Calgary including significant structure and term and signing bonus all those things that they were looking for so he takes less he goes 500 miles away from home and he's on a team that's significantly worse now in the Columbus Blue Jackets. You go from the Pacific Division winner in Calgary to a team that's rebuilding. How does this happen? What happened? I wonder, like, does he look at Columbus like Artemi Panarin looked at the New York Rangers when he signed there? As you know, they're in a rebuild. The and, it, and it, oh. no, because they were in a rebuild when he signed there, right? And then they built up some guys. Now they got lucky in the draft lotteries, make no mistake about it. But um, I'm just curious if he looks at Columbus and feels like, oh, you know what? Maybe they got some guys coming. But my question to this, Frank, is because um, I had tweeted out, I was like, hey, Line A and Gaudreau. But then I realized Patrick Line A's not signed yet. I know right. he's got a qualifying offer, but um, he, they, they don't have enough cap space to sign uh, Patrick Line A. Currently, they're going to have to move somebody. Yeah, so Aaron Portsline from The Athletic, who was the first person to hint at the Gaudreau possibility, and that wasn't until 5 p.m. Eastern, said that they do have enough space and their plan is still to sign Patrick Laine, even with Johnny Gaudreau, um, that they'll make room elsewhere, which is probably somewhat easy to do. Um, I when you, when you said Panarin, I was thinking the opposite. Panarin's thing was like, I, I want to get to a big market. I want to go to the glitz and glamour of yeah. Broadway. I'm like, Johnny Gaudreau is known as, I don't want to say a different guy because I don't think that that's necessarily fair, but I think he, it's probably safe to say he's a pretty quiet guy and a somewhat shy guy. Um, and so maybe he wants to be in a place where there's not much attention. Like maybe that's what made Columbus oh. super attractive to him. 100%. I'd, I'd heard that, Frank. To me, when I signed that, I was like, there's a guy. And here's the thing. The, the Columbus hockey fans, it's a diehard, passionate fan base. 
it's just not a massive fan base. That's all. But the Blue Jackets fans, they're, they're highly loyal. It's a really good atmosphere. I've been to the to the rink in Columbus. I actually really like it. Uh, I'm a I'm one of the I'm rare not sla- guys. I would never slag Columbus. I actually yeah. like the city. It's a good vibe. Like, it's still one of the most anonymous franchises in pro sports, and I yeah, don't care what no, anyone that, says. That that's totally fair. It's funny because uh, as I, I was having quick dinner with my wife and son before the pod, and um, I explained to them that you know Johnny Gaudreau had left Calgary there, and so I was playing. Okay, well, guess where he went. And I gave him hints. It was in the Eastern Conference, their name and teams. I'm like, what? And I was, and my wife's like, God, I forget Columbus is in the league. Now, granted, my wife's not a huge uh, NHL uh, hockey fan, but uh, you're right. I think Columbus maybe isn't that one. But this, this will give like Patrick Liney accepted a trade there. Now you got Johnny Gaudreau that's going there. Like, who knows? Maybe, maybe the things are changing in Columbus. Maybe this is their jumping off point because uh, maybe we'll see. But. It is, uh, it, it is surprising. I will say this, though, Frank, that the New Jersey Devils, I know they were always interested in it, but I never understood the Devils' interest because I felt like they would have too many small forwards in their top six, and I just didn't think that that was a recipe for success. Yeah, but I think that's an easy thing to fix, right? Like, you can always add some players with edge after the fact, right? I think, at least. Um, maybe not quite as skilled, but you can find a complementary piece here or there. No. It's so much harder to find, like you, where are you going to get a point per, like point per game players? We've talked about this for a year. Point per game players don't make it to market. No, not only not that, but 115 point guys that finished second in league scoring last year, right in the heart of their career. I, it, it doesn't happen. So to think that you're sitting there near New Jersey and you've got $23 million in cap space or whatever it is, and you're not able to get it like you've got Hughes you've got he shirt on the middle they traded uh Pavel Zaka on Wednesday and you're thinking all right this this is what they're setting up is to get to this moment you can have Brat and Gaudreau on the wings like I I'm I'm surprised that it didn't and there were rumblings out there I'd be curious to see what the devils ultimately say so it, I don't like I, I'm just I don't, so we don't know a lot of details at the moment. So this is purely just me spitballing and speculating and trying to wrap my brain around it. A couple things happened. One, either Gaudreau didn't have as robust of a market as he thought and ends up in Columbus by default, or a team like New Jersey was in the mix. And one of the things that I had heard as Wednesday went on was perhaps the devils had balked at some of his ask for signing bonus um, because that was one of the things that he asked for in Columbus or excuse me, in Calgary was uh, so much of that deal to be in signing bonus, like a a big, big part of it, you know, 75% of it or more. Um, Interesting that in Columbus, he signs seven times 9.75 straight salary. So then I'm like, okay, well that pours cold water on that. He doesn't get any signing bonus. I don't think. And you're like, holy smokes, like what, what happened here? Were the Islanders, were they in and, and then backed out? Like they don't have, they have cap issues just like the Flyers. I think ultimately, Jay, the Flyers were interested and intrigued. Um, they really were intoxicated by the buzz that Johnny Gaudreau had created in the marketplace because For the first time in my life that I can remember living here, born and raised, the Flyers have become a non-entity in town. They're not a thing. And I wonder if they were feeling the need to get in on it. And they obviously didn't in the end, but because of, you know, ticket sales are going to shoot up because of interest, because your team is going to be better. All those things I think were intriguing but they just found the price to, and I know they explored the market for James Van Reems like pretty significantly to try and move him. I think there were five to six teams in the end that uh, were asking for a significant price, uh, including a first round pick. Uh, Buffalo, Chicago, Arizona, uh, Detroit. So they did all their homework. Like they knew what that market was to get off of James Van Riemsdyk. And they were just like, we're not doing it. We're not doing that. Plus the mega deal for, for Gaudreau plus, you know, how this hams up our cap space moving forward. They just felt like maybe they weren't 
one player away from being a team that needed him. Yeah. And that, and that makes total sense. Right. So you know, I credit Columbus for stepping up you know, at, at this huge day for their organization. That, you know, arguably maybe the biggest day in franchise history. When, when you think about it, as far everyone as everyone leaves, yeah, think exactly. about all the talent they've had there and no one ever like when's what's the last marquee Columbus free agent signing you can think of. Well, I, with Zach, well, Zach Wierenski, I guess, right? He stayed, but that would probably He stayed, be but he was drafted yeah. there. That's different. Yeah. Who's the last unrestricted free agent no. marquee, big boy, big contracts out, you know, that, that Columbus signed? Yeah, no, it, it's rare. I will say this, though. Winnie Nathan teams, Horton? Like, who is it? Like, I, I can't. It's got to be, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, like, that, there's none that I might be missing one. There's not any that jump off the page. That, that I can think of like they've acquired some pretty big names via trade, but not so much via free agency. And um, I'm a big believer of free agency markets, a, a part of it. And, and obviously this is an exception because usually guys will go to winning teams, right? Like, you know, New York's different, right? New York has a massive advantage, especially, you know, you mentioned Panarin earlier, Frank, um, you know, the, the Russian community in New York is, is very enticing for a lot of Russian players who want to go there. They love it. And I totally can understand that, right? You get a little bit of a taste of home uh, when you're there in the, in the Russian uh, community in New York. But, you know, you look at teams that want to sign free agents when you're a winning team, it changes, right? Like no one now Edmonton always overpaid free agents today. They didn't have to overpay any free agent, right? And because they're winning. Well, let me ask you this. How do you feel now if you're Calgary? Like you could at least wrap your brain around and understand the need to go home. Like you're like, you know what, no matter what we did, it wasn't going to happen. Like it just wasn't in the cards for us. We treated you well, but you're off to your next thing. And we just, you had something we couldn't match. I, I just went through all the scenarios. It's $15.75 million. He left on the table plus a worse team plus an anonymous team. I, I, I can't, I can't even begin to explain I'd be, I would be in my office if I was Brad Tree Living kicking my wall in. Well, he, Frank, this, this is a classic case where Johnny Gaudreau is going to say, it's not you, it's me, right? This is the classic breakup, Frank. Maybe you've used it at times. Maybe someone's used it on you. Our listeners have used it. But uh, Cal Calgary could go crazy trying to think, like, what did we do wrong, right? Like, remember if you ever get dumped? Because it probably feels like they got broken up with right now. And uh, you're like, well, what could I have done different? Oh, maybe I should have done this. I, like there's certain things, Johnny Gaudreau is American. I think a lot of it just comes down to citizenship a little bit at times. There's lots of Part American of it, guys but like, who want to play you're, in the You're States. looking at Columbus and you're like, that, that guy is so much uglier than me. Why did she leave me for that? And I'm not slagging. Yeah, like I just maybe told they have you a better I like Columbus. You're, Frank, you're not, maybe they have a better I, personality. I don't know. I maybe, maybe she's smarter. I, I he's yeah. smarter. I don't, I don't know. Like I can't, I don't get this one. And, and, and I think when you're like, here's what I'll tell you this to give you some behind the scenes. I think what makes this even harder for Calgary to stomach because it was really hard on Tuesday is they really actually engaged on Tuesday afternoon and evening into some pretty significant talks to bring Johnny Gaudreau back. Yeah. They not only went down the path with the offer that I talked about, um, 10 and a half times eight, they talked, I was, I was told about, uh, structure about signing bonus about all these little, you know, closet, everything that you do when you are about to get married. Mm -hmm. and yeah. they were left kind of standing at the altar. Like it, it came time to, you know, it's five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock Eastern. It came time to put pen to paper, knowing that the eighth year was about to vanish and they just couldn't get it done. And so when you go through that, like I said, you can at least, you can wrap your brain around it. You're like, he's going home. I get it. I couldn't compete with that. This one now you're like, really? Yeah. Well, 
fair or unfair? Am I am I no, over no, dramatizing? I, I can see how I can see Calgary being rattled, man. Like it, this is just not something that happens in the NHL. We've talked about this. Other than you know John Tavares, I guess Alex Petrangelo to a sense he had won a Stanley Cup. He's pretty elite defenseman. So there has been a few recently. And you know, but he went to Tavares, Vegas, the shiny new toy, the team that had been to the Cup yeah. final, the the exciting new franchise where it's a you know unbelievable place to play. Like this, this, th- th- these are not those. Yeah, yeah. But hey, we could get into Vegas for, and we have to get into Vegas. Like, are, are they the most mismanaged cap team in the NHL right now? Like, oh my goodness. Never seen anything like it. Like, they're just, they literally, they had, in order for Carolina, and I like this trade. Carolina I basically love this just trade. takes on cap hit. They get Max Pacioretty, who's probably going to score 20 to 25 goals in his sleep. 20 to 25. He scored th- an average of 36 the last yeah. four seasons. Well, I, I'm just saying, even worse it's case. It's free. Scenario. Yeah, and, three ninety nine. Hey, don't overlook Dylan Coughlin, man. That defenseman. Oh, I think he's a, okay. he has got potential boatloads. He's going to be in Carolina. He's he's gonna he's going to be um, sheltered. He's not going to have to have big demands on him early on. Um, there's potential there. He might not pan out, but either way, that's that's two summers in a row where they gave up guys for nothing. But then you throw in Nate Schmidt uh, a few years ago. Um, Mark, yeah, Mark Andre Fleury, as you referenced. Yeah, like it's. It's ridiculous to me on, on, on the, the mismanagement of the salary cap for Vegas Golden Knights. And for a team that five years ago started at zero. Yeah. Like, it's not like you are inheriting a team that has an absolute train wreck on your cap. And you say, you know what? I got to dig my way out of this. That this was created by this management team that's in place with George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon, not by anyone else. And I admire their willingness to go for it and to try and win. That mantra is what makes a team so enticing for any player to play on. But also what's happened here over the last number of years now, from Paul Stastny to Marc-Andre Fleury to Nate Schmidt, guys that Max Pacioretty that really did not want to leave, you create an environment where players don't want to go because they are the next piece of meat that's on the move. And right now, Frank, is Logan Thompson their starting goalie? Like, is Robin Leonard going to be healthy to start the year? Is Lauren Bersois going to be healthy to start the year? Like, they still got questions. I, that's a great question. I've heard rumblings that, that Robin Leonard not only may not be ready to start the year, maybe out for a while. Like, I don't think anyone knows the answer to this. They're still trying to figure it out. I think. Yeah. So yeah, you're, the L- you're the LA Kings and Vancouver Canucks. You're pretty excited about what's going on in Vegas and Calgary right now. How about the Edmonton Oilers? Well, well, they were a playoff team. So, you know, um, and so the Oilers LA. now become the team to beat in the Pacific. Not because they got to the final four, but. Yeah, probably when you consider, um, like, well, they got McDavid and dry saddle, right? The guys, they went nuclear. So yeah, when I you don't consider think Calgary done. just lost a 115 point player. Now we'll see, maybe they shock us and get Nazem Kadri. I don't know, but even Nazem Kadri, I don't think replaces Goudreau and, um, Vegas. Now Vegas is the wild card for me because if Vegas is healthy, they still got a lot of good players. How could you argue healthy. that that team has, has improved? Oh, Vegas. Yeah, no, that's after fair. missing the playoffs. How could, I mean, maybe you say the coaching change will spare it on. We have significant questions in goal. How could, how could they have possibly improved taking a 36 goal scorer out of their lineup for yeah. nothing? I, I think they might improve simply by not having 500 man games lost injury. Oh, I mean, right. That would be a start. Yeah. But you're right. That's fair. No, I, I never even thought about that. Yeah. I guess Edmonton probably would be considered the favorite in the Pacific right now. Vegas, Vegas, baby. Hey, uh, another team that was very busy today and uh, they had a lot of cap space. They had a lot of uh, places to sign the Detroit Red Wings and Steve Eiserman looks like, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of trying to come out of the rebuild now, Frank, uh, them and both the Ottawa senators. I was going to say, which one weeks. did you like more Ottawa or Detroit? Both of them saying now's the time. Well, see, the thing is I look at both teams. And I know they, imp- and they had lots of room to improve, right? Like you're talking 27, 30 points. They got to make up to get to the playoffs. Um, I, I still have concerns about the blue lines on both teams. I think they've improved their goaltending. I think they've improved their forwards. I don't know if either team has a blue line 
that's a like they could compete for a playoff spot maybe compete are they're not a lock like i saw some people say oh these guys are going right to the to the playoffs i'm like pump the brakes like look at their blue lines in both cities right that's i i agree with you i i just i i'm i'm trying to think of which top six i like better ottawa or i think it's ottawa but i like ottawa's top six yeah Yeah. it's it's good like i think it was a slight overpay for Giroux Mm -hmm. at six five but he adds a real authenticity to their team and a compete level that I think it was worth a little bit of an overpay. Um, he still scored 65 points or 66 points. So it's probably close to in line with market value. Um, man, the, the Debrinket trade though, like you, you mash all these things together and you get, you know, maybe another one of your defense prospects that steps up for Ottawa you know, you, you got rid of Matt Murray, which was a huge plus. Now Talbot's in net with Forsberg. Like, I love Detroit's goaltending to begin with. Like, I really liked Nadelkovic, and I was a believer. Now you add in Huso. Like, I don't know. Like, so if you were to stat, like, just pure back of the napkin, not think about it, rank the teams in the Atlantic, what order would you go in? Oh, ah. Florida is not, not better, right? No. Uh, How could oh, they be? Florida, yeah, they made some small moves. Florida's still good, though. But they lost Florida guys, t- though. They lost Florida Giroux. T- they lost. Yeah, um, but Giroux wasn't Giroux. there all year, right? And they were still. So, to me, Tampa and, and Florida are still 1-2. And then, um, you know, Toronto's 3. They got some question marks. The health of Matt Murray. I think the health of Matt Murray is actually the bigger question I have than the play of Matt Murray. But uh, the health of Matt Murray. But I'd still put Toronto 3. Um, Boston, let's see. If Bergeron comes back, well, that obviously changes a lot of things. And Krejci. Yeah. But they're going to have such if, a hellacious start to their season with the injuries to all those guys, yes. including McAvoy. Uh, like half their defense is, is like yeah. in the uh, medical ward between now and December. Yeah. That's, uh, and Marshawn's so, out for what? The first two and a half months? Yep. And I think Montreal is actually going to be a lot better. Depending on the, pri- on the health of Carey Price. Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's a big one. Um, and, and their defense core too. Same thing in, in Montreal. Like I, Buffalo looks like they're keeping their, their powder drive for one more year. Hey, eh, Frank, they're going to wait. I think that makes sense. Cause yeah. at some point, I don't know. We talked about a rebuild for Boston. Like at some point they're going to have to do something, right? Rip the bandaid off. Well, they're lucky because they've got Marshawn and Pasternak and McAvoy. Those guys aren't old. No, but. Well, definitely Pasternak and McAvoy aren't right. So. And I like that trade for Boston today. I like the Zaka. I like the potential of that trade. Hall is more consistent player. I think Zaka, um, you know, maybe a new home for him. He could uh, he could turn out to be a pretty good deal. I like those hockey trades. We don't see those very often in the offseason. One for one, straight across. Mm-hmm. Kind of like that deal, actually. I like it for both teams for different reasons. But uh, I, I like the upside potential for Boston more in that trade. Mm. So you asked me before we started, who is my favorite or best value signing of the day? Yeah. Ilya Samsonov. Yeah, that was mine too. 1.8. What the? Yeah, 1.8. Like, are you kidding me? Like, A, it gives him protection on Murray and gives him a I guy. think he's going to outplay Murray. He might, right? I th- Right value. from Jump Street, I think he's going to be their starter all year. That's my bold prediction. Ooh, all right. I think at 25, he's ready to take off. He, I think he needed to get out of Washington. Um, he's got, look. Matt Murray's pedigreed. Who's kidding who? He's got two Stanley Cups. Um, but Sam Sonoff is a first round pick. Like this is a guy that is uber talented. And I think, you know, with a better team in front of him than what we saw in Washington, that really at times gave up a lot. Um, I think they're gonna be pretty good. I think Toronto, though, is gonna they're gonna give Matt Murray every opportunity to have success. It's two years at 4.7, Frank. They they don't want to just have it the 10 games into the season. All of a sudden he's their backup. So I think, you know, he's going to go there early. He's going to start working with their goalie coach. And like I said, to me, I think if Matt Murray stays healthy, then then he can be all right. And don't overplay him. That's the other advantage. They don't have to overplay him now with, with Samson off because, you know, that guy can easily play 40 games to you and, and, and shouldn't be that bad at all. Hmm. Yeah. It's what an interesting day. I'm still, now, now I want to go back to, because as surprising as the Goudreau signing was, that might not have been the biggest surprise. Like, 
the Erica Branson one, when you look at all the other D like that one kind of came out of left field to me a little bit, like good for Gabranson. I never blame the player ever when you get the good deal, but a four years at four mil, like they're obviously planning on playing him in their top four. No question. Right. I hope but, he's buying Daryl Sutter a new tractor or something. <laughs> like, honestly, like we, he owes him a significant chunk of that deal. And Zadaroff signed a new two year deal to stay in Calgary two times three, seven, five, exactly what he made last year. Yeah. I actually liked the signing. Uh, I thought he really was a nice fit in Calgary and they, Daryl Sutter did wonders for him. They oh, yes. really got on the same page when he was a healthy scratch in the beginning of the year. I think I've told the story before on the pod. They spent a long time working together, going over video, telling him exactly what he wanted. And by the end of the year, he was in a great spot. So he stays in a place that he's comfortable. Yeah, no, I, uh, and now, probably wouldn't have been possible if they kept Johnny Gaudreau. But now what happens with Matthew? Yeah. As we're recording this, Frank, and it's now uh, 9 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock uh, Pacific, uh, 6 Pacific, Nazem Kadri, Andre Palat, John Klingberg. It's the latest. Um, so John Klingberg... I don't know. I, I don't know the answer on any of these three players. I, they're all expensive. They are all in a operating in a cap world where I don't know the exact percentage, but 90 some percent of the dollars are already spoken for. And they're asking for big money over big term. Like Pilat is the most interesting case because I was told that he was really hungry to stay in Tampa and understandably so after all the success that they had he actually I heard I heard and I don't know if it's true or not the rumor was he went back to Tampa in the last number of days and said I'll take the same deal as Nick Paul seven years times three million to stay can you squeeze that in and the answer was no so everyone wow. thought Andre Palat was destined for New Jersey. Like it was one of those ones that all the other teams around the league had all assumed was already cooked and finished. Like it was like, you know, how a, a slew of them got announced at 12. A lot of people thought Palat was in that category. Um, there is a thought that he might have something available for him at, you know, in the five times high fives. I don't, if that is true, I don't know why it's not signed. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Fair. And like, if not, does he go somewhere on a cheaper deal? That's what I would ask. Yeah. Like I wonder New Jersey's maybe licking their wounds. Uh, Tom Fitzgerald didn't hold a, a media veil uh, at the end of the day, which is a little bit odd, but they didn't really have anything to announce, I guess. And that was, it was funny because that announcement came out and literally two minutes later, the uh, Goudreau to Columbus announcement came out. So maybe they were tied together, but Nazem Kadri, Frank, um, you had reported that, you know, they were, and Hey, what guys are looking for and what you the get the speculation. Totally yeah. Things. Was that he was looking for seven times eight. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, like I like Nazem Kadri, but you know, he's, he's a 60 point guy. He had the one unreal year up to 87, but uh, he is 32. Do you still think he gets a, a seven year deal or is, um, is this one where like, is there still enough bidders for him to get it? I don't know. Uh, he was taking his time going through the process. I'm told that this was an old school, you know, 2006 type approach to free agency where, you know, you're on a bunch of zoom calls and you're talking to the head coach and you're talking to the GM and they've Smart. got their PowerPoint presentation. And I love that. Like, yes. Um, not how the world works anymore. And today's immediate gratification. I need to know my team four days ago thing. Um, so full re respect and, and marks to Kadri for going through the process. I think the wrench in the, in, in all of it is the team that doesn't have the best offer, but has a really exciting and enticing offer is the Colorado avalanche. Yes. They don't have anything else. They don't have anyone to replace him. They mm -hmm. have a defined, I would imagine budget that Chris McFarland has mapped out their new GM that says we can afford to pay you X times X. And I don't know what it is, but Chris gear had crunched all the numbers for us months back. They are able to afford him. 
Um, I don't know what the Arturi Lekanen. Yes, I was just gonna say. I think how I'm that looking... hams it up, but it yeah. it's it's definitely on the table for him to stay in Colorado. And I think my guess, my hunch is that what he's weighing is these couple extra bucks here or stay and go try and, you know, go back to back in Colorado and beyond. Well, I think the challenge for Kadri now is if you look at the abs and they don't have anybody on LTIR or anything like that currently, they've only got about 3.9 mil in, in cap space because of the Nikchushkin, uh, Lekkinen and the uh, Josh Manson deals, right? Obviously they have to leave some money uh, next year for, uh, for Nathan McKinnon. And some of that could come from Eric Johnson's $6 million cap it potentially uh, coming off the books and, you know, JT Confer, you know, maybe he has to go too. So there's nine and a half if, if you're looking at a raise for McKinnon, but well, Colorado would have to get creative to get him on the cap. Well, creative is what you do when you're trying to win. How creative have we seen the Tampa Bay lightning be the team? They just beat They're yeah. creative all the time. Uh, John Klingberg, I think it's probably fair to say that the market wasn't as robust as he thought it might be. Um, when did we hear that December, November, when they said John Klingberg's ask in Dallas was eight times eight. And I was like, what, <laughs> uh, that was a lot then obviously it's clearly far from that. Now I was told they re-engaged or circled back to the Dallas stars at some point this afternoon. And I think it was more driven by the Klingberg camp as opposed to really, significant interest from the stars. Cause I just don't think they have the money. It's not that they don't like John Klingberg. They do. And they realize how desperately John Klingberg wanted to remain in Dallas. Like he did not want to go anywhere. He went kicking and screaming. And that's part of the reason why we saw the trade request and why he was so emotional is because he really wanted to stay. Um, and they respect him and that, but Signing Mason Marchment chewed up a lot of the money that they could have given him, and they made the decision to go with Marchment. And, uh, Frank, as we're recording this, is just coming down. Ryan Strom, five years with the Anaheim Ducks as uh, they get into the free agent market. And, uh, you know, they'll be – hey, they, they released a lot of uh, their guys on – well, not a lot, but uh, they didn't qualify Milano and Steel. So they've definitely uh, got some uh, – some cap space. I do want to get to a team we haven't talked a lot about, but you, you look at their deals today without having to give up hardly anything. Now they added a lot of cap space, but Carolina gets Brent Burns for uh, for Lorenz and a, and, a, and a prospect goalie and, and a conditional pick, and then Pacioretty right for, for nothing basically, and uh, and Coglin. Um, Brent Burns to Carolina, man, that I think I still think Brent Burns has got a lot of a lot of. Uh, a lot of tread left on his tires. I really like this trade for Carolina. He brings a different attitude to that team. I, I, I like everything Carolina did. I feel like I always like everything Carolina does. Um, they were like, you know what? This free agent class, meh, like not really for us. Let's look at what's out there on the trade front. Um, I don't know. I, I just think Burns is has got a lot left in the tank. And I think Pacioretty's a game changer up front. And they're not married to either guy super, super long term. So Pacioretty's one year, Burns is three. Like, if you need to get out of it, you can. Yeah. Can you imagine? Like, their defense is already really hard to play against. Yeah. You don't even need Brent Burns to play a lot of defense because – They've got really good defenders. Oh, Slavin and Shea and, oh, man, yeah, Brad Pesci. Yeah, well, hey, you know, well, there's the replacement for Tony D'Angelo in the power play. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, Taylor made go, go. That's what they were looking for, right? I think they had explored a number of different guys that they kicked tires on. Petrie, Burns, Barry, a whole select Tory Krug. Go down the list. There's all these guys that were available that Carolina looked at. And I think they ended up in saying, Hey, Burns is a pretty reasonable acquisition cost. Let's do that. Frank, do we have, do I have to go get a, like a, a piece of glass, like a glass plate and put it under the nose of the jets to see like, do they know free agency is going on? Like what's happening in Winnipeg? What does that mean? I've never heard that. Oh, you've never heard. Well, it's, 
It's actually for a different uh, saying that uh, probably not. It's a little bit too R-rated for the pod, but uh, I'll explain it to you uh, later on. Like, are you really you're asking checking. if they need to go like, like check if they're breathing, right? Like oh. you put the so you can see, right? Because they'll see the breath on there. Like, are they alive? Uh, are uh, they breathing? What's uh, going on here? Uh, uh, Winnipeg is one. What about the Vancouver Canucks? Yeah, they got Mikheyev, and we'll That's see. A huge number for Mikheyev. Yeah, big number. Big number. And and still no JT Miller trade. Uh, so uh, I think they're going to start the season with JT Miller. And which leads me to the one trade of the day that I was a little surprised by because I've liked a lot of their moves. Connor Brown's a really good player. And I understand if he wasn't going to sign back in, in Ottawa. But why not keep him? Have your team be more competitive. And if you're not in the playoff run, then you trade you trade him. I think you could have got more than – I think you could have at least got a second rounder then. That's the one trade, unless they're doing it just to free up cap space and they've got another trade for a defenseman coming. That's the one trade that I'm a little perplexed by because their top six is great, but Connor Brown, if he's on your third line, man, you got a really good third line. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What what team was most perplexing to you today? Hmm, that's a good question. I think Vancouver is up there. Yeah, they didn't. Well, they didn't really do much, but I'm not sure what they could do. That's their problem. Like they don't. I don't well, know. They what the could have done a whole going. lot of things. Like, like I think Vancouver they didn't create any been... real cap flexibility for themselves. Like they said they were going to. Yeah. Well, and and the thing is that the the summer is not over yet. Like there's still time. We'll we'll see if some other teams want to, uh, you know, move around. But the thing about the Canucks is. I st- like to me, I thought the Canucks were one of the more disappointing teams in the NHL last year. I still think they've got some talent on that team. I really like Demko and goal, right? Um, I'm still waiting for Elias Pettersson to, to, to show what he's capable of for long stretches. Cause I think he's pretty good. Right. Um, Miller or Horvat. I like now Horvat and, and Miller are both UFAs and the last year their deal. So they're going to, you know, you're getting banged for their buck. Um, you know, McKay is probably a little bit overpaid for what he might do on that team. Um, you know, Quinn Hughes, like they're he- they're top heavy on defense. I just don't know who they could trade to free up cap space. That's the problem, right? Ding, like ding, the Connor ding, Garland Ryan signing, Miller. it's only one year. We're not signing that trade. And then the contract, like that hasn't worked out yet. They got to hope that that gets better because 4.9, they didn't get great return on that. Well, that's the exact return that they're, they kind of got from, or might get from Mikheyev for very similar money. Yeah, possibly. Like what is the best upside you could possibly think of for Mikheyev? What is he? Nah. Well, man, like it's a good question. Like he, he the first two years, the guy couldn't, you know, he, he couldn't score in, in a brothel with a, you know, pocket full of yeah. hundreds, but last year, right. He, he, shooting percentage got up, not crazy high, but, but higher. He, and he also shot the puck way more. That's the other thing. He had 147 shots to 107. Uh, the year prior, the guy can flat out fly. He's a really good penalty killer. Um, but you're right. Like, but if he scores you 20 goals and kills a lot of penalties for you and, and uh, doesn't get scored on five on five, th- then you can probably say, okay, but it depends where they play him. I'm very curious who they're going to play him with. Yeah, you, I agree. You mentioned Winnipeg and the glass plate. Um, I don't know. I never really think of Winnipeg as a free agent player. Cause it's really hard to get guys to go there. Like, I don't ever think of it as their day, but I am perplexed at them. Not, it never really got hot and heavy on Blake Wheeler. Yeah. Like if you're making changes to your team and you're changing up the mix, I get kind of, I mean, look, you mentioned there's a lot of summer left and something could materialize, but it looks at the moment, like they're running it back, which I don't know that that'll ultimately be the case, but it's been pretty quiet on Blake Wheeler. And I think I was told one of, uh, one of the things that they were presented with or talked about, they're not willing to retain on Blake Wheeler. That's the sense I'm getting from around the league is they were asked, are you willing to retain? And the answer was no. And that kind of at 8.25 has killed a lot of the momentum or any momentum that might've existed. No, that's fair. Like, I just, I, I agree. They're, they're not a, a huge destination, but they made trades. Like there was all this talk about Winnipeg and now it's nothing's happened now. Hey, maybe who knows? Like I said, they, 
They got, they got still got over two months until you get to training camp. So maybe they can do something, Frank, but it's a, uh, that's been uh, surprising to me uh, for sure. But it was a Want crazy to hear day. another weird team. I don't know. What? Maybe not a weird team, but we got to talk about their last two weeks. What do you make of the Pittsburgh Penguins? <laughs> you know what? The, the Penguins are, well, here's, here's two things. If Sidney Crosby doesn't get hurt, they, they probably beat the Rangers when they're up three to one. And I think that's valid to say. Right, I think they probably could win that series. So How about the Rangers also signing Casey to Smith, They're like hey, or not Casey to Smith, um, Louis Domingue, the old spicy pork and broccoli king. After that three OT game, they're like, you want to come on down to MSG and play here, uh, spot duty if we need you behind, uh, you know, if 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 Igor Shesterkin and Yaroslav Halak get hit by a bus. Yeah, yeah, smart. But I look at the Penguins and. You know what they are? They're they're and I understand loyalty in hockey, I get it. But man, like I'm I'm still floored about the Ricard Raquel contract. That that's the six years for Ricard Raquel. Like they went long term on Rust and Raquel and Latang and Malkin got four like Jenny Malkin, who might be the best of all of them. I think he's older and he's a little injury prone, but he only got four years. Like, I don't know. This is one where I think the veterans they still believe as a group that they can win. I think that's and so management said, okay, you know what, Sid. And, and the gang, we're trusting you guys. They got one, two last hurrahs, but it's either gonna, they're either going to surprise us and be competitive or, oh, my goodness, the next few years in, in uh, Pittsburgh are going to be a slow aging death of that franchise. Funny because Not I talked to the franchise, but of that era of the Penguins. I talked to a GM in the last few days that loved the Raquel signing and thought it was market value. And I was like, really? Hmm. Um, oh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe I am. I'm, I share the same opinion as you. Um, you know what the, this off season feels like for the Penguins? It's like, even though Ron Hextall and and Brian Burke were brought in to help like lead them into the next era, it feels like at some point in the last couple of weeks they were like, "Ah, what the hell? We're not going to be here in five years. Let's just do whatever the heck we need to do to get this done." This is going to be someone else's problem in five years. That's what it felt like to me. It was like a classic, don't worry about anything else. But the other thing is, you know, maybe with the ages of, like, I like I think we all kind of think Crosby for these next three years, it, he's more or less ageless, right? Like it's his play has yeah. dropped off some, but it's not. No, a big in a big way. No, not at all. So if you've got Crosby, that's somewhat ageless plus Gensel in his prime plus rust in his prime and Raquel in his prime, that maybe with another 60 point, you know, keep turning out 60 point seasons from Latang that you've got enough, even if, you know, Malkin is just okay. Even if the rest of the group is just okay, Carter, you know, you've probably got enough to be competitive in the East to make the playoffs. Oh yeah. No, I, I think, you know, the penguins for sure are there. I just, I give, it's just the longer terms of the deals, right? If that to me is the one where I look and say, Hmm, there's going to be some, uh, there's going to be some pain, but that pain's inevitable, I guess. So maybe, you know what they look and say, we want to extend our window as long as we can. Right. Um, LA didn't have that long of a pain, after they uh, they won the two cups in in three years, right? Like theirs was kind of short, and now they're they're turning it around, and they look to be a competitive team again. Chicago's like I don't even know what league they're in right now, but it's they're going to be a long ways away from being competitive for for quite some time, right? Um, we we've seen other teams have similar where seven Detroit, years. Right? The Detroit, Detroit oh, Red seven. Wings. This was seven years until they were able to hit the go button today. Well, look at Chicago, though, Frank. Chicago base, because I don't count the uh, the 2020 season where they got gifted a playoff spot in 24th. Trust me. This would be five consecutive years already where they haven't been in the playoffs. And a lot of those years, not But they close. didn't even try to rebuild it then. No, no. They and resisted Chicago. thinking that they would continue to be somewhat competitive. They were well, just in stuck one... in the worst spot possible. Well, it, think about it. Last summer, they went after McCabe and Seth Jones and said, we're revamping our blue line. And now, now, granted, the GM got fired. They got a whole new regime in. And now suddenly, they're like, nope. Right? They reverse. They're doing a 180. And they're going the complete other direction. They're getting rid of everybody. 
right? They let Kubalik and Strom walk for nothing. They they traded Doc and they traded to Brinkat. And who else are they going to trade? Like maybe Patrick Kane. I don't know. But yeah, the, the direction of where Chicago is going like that to me is going to be a, a, a long, painful uh, rebuild for that team. And they're all, to me, they're already five years into it, right? They haven't been competitive for five years if you look at the standings. So uh, th- that's a fascinating team for me. And so maybe Pittsburgh says, you know what? Hey, we know the pain's coming. But we're going to extend the fact that we think with Sidney Crosby, we still got a chance. And maybe they're right. Maybe I'm totally wrong on it. I just, yeah. the, Ra- the Raquel deal was the one. I thought he would get squeezed a little bit in free agency. And then Me he got too. six years. Good for him. Especially after being knocked out cold in that game at the Garden. Oh, yeah, well. Out cold. Like, he played in two playoff games. It's amazing that he even came back. Yeah. Um, Got to ask you about the Sharks, too. What did you think of Mike Greer's first week in office? Well, Mike Greer, I I think, you know what? It's clear that he wants to change the makeup of his team. He wants the Sharks to be a little bit harder to play against. Um, But they also lost arguably their best defenseman for for very little, right? Steven Lorenz can, you know, be a bottom six forward who brings some energy, sure. But, like, right now, look how many forwards they got in San Jose. I think they got, like, 17. So, um you know, they're, they're going to say, hey, we're going to have a competitive training camp and, and see what happens. I, I think they're trying to shop. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, who was injured all of last uh, season? Kevin LeBanc. Kevin LeBanc. Right? I, I think they're trying to, to move him. But uh, I just look at the type of guys uh, he brought in. He's just looking at some more competitive uh, players to see if they can just be a little bit harder to play against for, for the coming uh, few seasons, uh, which is funny because they still got a lot of older players on that team. So... I don't really know what their direction is. They still have three goalies. You know, I have to think they're going to move one of them, right? Uh, lots of teams because they they won't clear waivers. So, you know, I, I think they might try to move one of those guys here uh, for something, maybe package it up with a bank. I have no idea. You surprised that they didn't move one of the goalies? A little bit at a time where there's a shortage of goalies. Yes, I am. Yeah, very much surprised. But I don't. Well, the we thing just is, talked about Vegas. Maybe one. I don't. I don't know why you'd help out a team in your division. No. But maybe I, I there's think, a team. Like maybe there's something out there that we're missing. Yeah. Well, Reimer is the one that I think everybody would have interest in. But that's their best goalie. I don't. I think would. They that's trade. the guy I wouldn't move. Yeah. Um, I I was thinking Aiden Hill's the guy to move. Relatively inexpensive. Yeah. Capo Kakinen probably has better numbers and more upside. But Hill has been pretty consistent. Yeah, you could move Hill. Was he like a two million dollar two point one cap? Two point one seven five. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of curious uh, on on you know they they gave Matt Benning four years now. It's it's at like one point three million, but I think they just said, hey, we expect you to be our third pair right defenseman for that the next still four years. Seemed a lot, right? Like third and and uh, kind of maybe four years the press is a box long time. A, a, a little bit, but um, yeah, Mike Greer. I think you're going to see a lot of turnover in San Jose under Mike Greer and Doug Waite. I think they're going to, they're really going to want to put their fingerprints on that team. They're going to want to change uh, a little bit of how they play. Um, I like Nico Sturm, by the way. Yeah. You like Sturm? Yeah. Three years times 2 million. I thought that was pretty sharp. Hmm. All right. He's oh, got yeah, some size. Hard. I mean, like that's yeah, hard because he's, you know, he can probably help a team like San Jose, whereas in Colorado, he's just not really getting any ice time. Right. They're just a deep well, yeah, he was he was basically asked to play fourth line, essentially needed more opportunity and minutes. He'll get that in San Jose and it's a reasonable number and he's only 27. What do you think of the Lindblom signing for them? Um, it seemed high. It's Sorry. harmless. I not it's not really like he, if he can get back to producing like he was really on that track before being diagnosed with cancer. Yeah um he still ended up with 12 goals and 26 points it's it's a little bit of a stretch but not a like it's not a jaw dropper by any sense no and if you think he's got the upside it's probably pretty fair yeah but i am curious on on who they're going to move out because they just they they simply have way too many forwards at this juncture so um they're uh, they're a team that's like they need a lot of things to go right for them if they're going to compete for a playoff yeah i agree are we bringing in young Uremchuk tonight? What are we doing? I think we are. Sure. This man has been hosting all day the Daily mm-hmm. Faceoff show, three hours live today. Massive viewing audience yeah, it, on our show. And the thing I liked about it too is we had a super, uh, super active YouTube chat as well. And they were all sitting there because on our Daily Faceoff live show, we have Frank up in the corner on our insider creep cam. 
and the YouTube chat was just loving it. Whenever Frank, there would be times where Frank would cover his mouth like a football coach almost. And it would send the YouTube chat going nuts because they're like, what does he not want us to know? What does he not want us to read? I was so careful to be like, oh man, don't pick your nose. Like, don't do anything <laughs> weird. Like somebody is watching, but like you're, it's for three hours and you're literally, I'm sitting here in my basement. Like you could kind of zone out a little bit if you're not yeah. thinking about it. And I would kept just being like, don't do anything stupid. Don't do anything <laughs> stupid. Uh, all right, let's get into a uh, free agent edition of Buy or Sell brought to you by our friends at DoorDash. Ding dong. I don't have my board set up here yet, so it's just me saying ding dong instead of hitting the button. Um, not quite as good as Liam, but the promo code rundown DD gets you 25% off and no delivery fees on your first order. All right, the Senators and Red Wings have a lot of people talking. I'm not willing to go as far as to say they'll both make the playoffs next year, but I'm going to say they both crack the 90 point mark next season. Buy or sell, Jason. Oh, I'll sell on that all day long. I, I don't, there's too many teams in that division. Uh, uh, the, the reason like they were, they had 77, 73 points last year, mm-hmm. 27 shy of eighth place, which was a hundred points. Like there was eight teams at a hundred and then there was a pretty big gap. I think they're going to close the gap this season, but if both of them are over 90, that means there's a significant change for a lot of points. So I will uh, sell. Yeah, I'm going to agree. I sell. I don't, I don't even know that either one gets to 90 and I think they both are getting a lot closer, but to get to 90, that means you're taking away a lot of points to your point, Jason, from Tampa, from Toronto, from Florida, from Boston. There are not going to be any easy nights in the Atlantic this upcoming season, but I don't know that either one's getting to 90. Yeah. So my thinking on it was just that I, you know, this past year, we knew who the eight teams in the East were, what in January? De- yeah, December, yeah. January. I think it'll be a lot more of a mushy middle. And you look to the Western Conference this year. Winnipeg was at 89, and then both Vancouver and Vegas got to 90 and missed the playoffs. So I just think the East could be of a bit more, you know, mushy middle. And those two stand out as teams who could maybe take a bit of a step forward. Uh, you guys talked about your favorite value deals and things like that. Uh, I want to go to the overpay department. I'm going to say Vincent Trocheck is the biggest overpay of the day, not because of his AAV. But because of the fact they had to go two more years than, say, Detroit did for a guy like Andrew Kopp. So Trocek gets my biggest overpay simply because of the term. Frank, do you buy or sell on that? Uh, I'm going to sell. The biggest overpay of the day was still Eric and Branson. I don't care what anyone says. Um, I thought Ilya Mikheyev was a very close second. Um, I don't know. I think Trocek is a steady player. And what I like about Trocek, not only is he consistent, but he has a relationship with Gerard Gallant going back to Florida and they know exactly what they're getting. I agree with Ty though. Uh, Like when I look at what cop signed for, like to me, it's the term on, on, on Trocheck, but it's, it's hard to, it's hard to argue Gabranson four times four, you know, good for him though. I've always said this, man, I'm pumped for any player, you know, like that's, man, that's a, that's life changing for him and his entire family. So that's awesome. But yeah, I will also uh, sell because I just think that that one was so out of left field uh, to me a little so bit. So you're but buying, Columbus, you're, you're saying you think that you, yeah, you think, Tro- no, you think Trocheck though is an overpay. But not no, the no, biggest no, overpay Branson's today. the biggest overpay. Uh, okay. Got All it. right. So once again, you're both uh, selling on my question. So maybe this one I'll, uh, I'll get to you guys. Johnny Goudreau, 115 points last season. He's going to Columbus, you know, maybe a little bit less help. He was on one of the best lines in hockey in Calgary last year. Johnny Goudreau under a hundred points next season. Jason, buy or sell? Oh yeah, I'm buying that. He's he's only ever been over a hundred points once. He had 99 before. Um, now, if that power play in Columbus gets going, that that's maybe it. Line is firing one time bullets all over the place. But yeah, I think it's going to be difficult for free because keep in mind, Kachuk also had a hundred points, right? Mm-hmm. Usually, if you're a hundred point guy. Unless you're Patrick Kane, usually there's other, you know, you're getting somebody else on your team that's around you that's close. I know McDavid obviously one year did it, uh, and next closest was 77 or something like that. But usually it's a little bit of tandem stuff where somebody's another 90-point guy. So if Gaudreau is getting 100, somebody's got to get 90 in Columbus, I don't see that. Not happening. So He hasn't hit it at any point previously. He had been close before 99. Before that, he was in the 80s for the most part, some years in the 70s. Um, I don't know. I love Johnny Gaudreau, the player. Um, I think he's so incredibly dynamic, creative, skilled, uh, is a rare play-driving winger. I just, 
he only has done it once essentially. So, and there were a few years prior to this one where they were quote down years. So to think that he's, you know, mid seventies, mid eighties, I, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility at all. You guys kind of hit on this a little bit earlier, but I had it written down. So I'll ask it anyways. The Vegas Golden Knights certainly didn't get better. They have a lot of question marks. Like you said, I'm going to say they miss the playoffs again next season. Frank, buy or sell? Uh, okay, so I'm just thinking about the division. I think Edmonton, Edmonton and L.A. get in. Again. L.A. in. Calgary, not sure yet. I want to know what happens with Kachuk. I'm going to say they, they I'm going to say they make it. I'm going to say Vegas and Vancouver get in. Yeah, they missed the playoffs by 3 points last year with 500 man games lost to injury. I um although I will say I want to I, ask me this again at the regular season when we know what their goaltending situation is True. because that point. is a that has to be a major concern for them over the next few months is as Frank had talked about at the top, uh Robin Leonard if if he's not ready to go uh, for much of the season, you're running out with Logan Thompson. Like, hey, hey, maybe Logan Thompson is is going to be a this year's a surprise goalie that comes out of nowhere, right? Like, I know he played a few games last year, but let's be real, it would be a surprise if all of a sudden he's your starter and you, and you're relying on him every most nights. So, uh, ask me again. But right now, I, I'm actually going to say that uh, 94 points. They're not going to have 500 games lost to injury, so they'll get they'll get in. Do both Go. Dallas and Nashville get in? That's the big question. Yeah, and that might determine whether Vegas gets in or not. Yeah, if it's five and three or four and four between the two divisions, that's a good point. And good point, Jason. Maybe a little premature when we don't know what the goaltending is like. No, yet. I like it though. It's a good question today. Uh, yeah. points bet bonus question brought to you by our friends over at Points Bet Canada. They are live in Ontario today. Kind of had that last day of school vibe, right? You know, everyone's sort of itching to pack up for the day and get out. So my question to you for you is summer themed. You know, you go to someone's backyard, you have people over, you're out at the cottage. What is your favorite yard game to play, Frank? Uh, we call it cornhole here. Do you call mm. it bago? I, I'm what a corn. Call? I'm a cornhole guy. Okay, yeah, it would be cornhole. Um, I don't even. I don't. Do I? I don't even know if I play any other yard games. Not a big baby. outdoor guy. Croquet all day long, man. Me and my buddies. We used to have epic croquet games uh i had a house you know how douchey of, uh, that sounds like no, how utterly no. douchey it is what croquet no yeah. come on frank do how people is, play croquet that are oh like, yeah like, dude what? you've never played real croquet then if you don't know like you play croquet we used to put coolers of beer on the steps everybody would come over to my place on on friday we had a house just off of white ave which is like a party strip in edmonton and uh, we would play these heated games of croquet. And the probably my favorite story ever, one of our buddies, uh, Hagen, you got to remember, we're in our like early 20s, right? So guys are maybe starting to get some success. And, <laughs> and he, was a, he was a tech guy before there were tech guys. So he was well ahead of us when it came to finances. He had just bought in a brand new Subaru. He was so jacked up. So he parks it right on the street in front of my house. We had all these shrubs and our buddy Hutch. So in croquet, you know, when, you, when your ball touches the other guy's ball, you can stand on it and then whack it and you put it far away. Well, Hutch winds up, I don't know how many beers deep we are at this point, and he crushes it. It goes through the shrubs, and all of a sudden we hear this dook. We go out there, and thankfully we're half snapped. Right behind the wheel well on the driver's side, huge dent. Like literally that car was four hours old. Oh, <laughs> and Ron again, he's wound pretty tight, but thankfully he was buckled because I think there might've been a brawl. But man, we used to play that game for hours, and we used to make it like the hardest course so you'd have to go to the backyard and there was lots of punishment and shots for losing. So oh, yeah. I love croquet and backyard parties, it, man. I don't think that's like a thing here. Oh, now, in fact, thing. I would tell you that I know it's not a thing. Like the only people that play croquet here are like otherworldly rich douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> like at, at like insane Trust me, country dude. clubs that you don't yeah. have any membership. Oh, I wish I could show you the house I that I, we used to rent. I lived there for like six years, had lots of different roommates. You know, our rent for the whole house was six fifty. We split it three ways. It was Damn. 217 bucks. It was what? Unreal. So wait a second. Where like why is it a thing in Edmonton though? And why is it how did you make it a game of the people? Croquet. Oh, we've always played croquet with with uh with our buddies growing up, man. It's great. Where did it why I, how I had never played it until like 
a couple summers ago and my dad bought a set and I had never oh. played it, but it's fun because you can like sewer people, right? Like, oh, totally. That's the great the part about it, man. It was awesome. You get yeah. into strategy about which guy you just wanted to rock out. It was awesome. Yeah. All right, gents, that's going to do it for another edition, the final free agent edition of Buy or Sell delivered by DoorDash. Awesome. That was uh, Tyler Uramchuk, uh brought to you by the 2022 Double IHF World Juniors. What better way to cool off than at the rink during the first ever World Juniors in the summer? Single game tickets for the tournament are on sale now, starting at just 40 bucks. So grab your sunglasses. The brightest stars in the junior game are coming to Edmonton this summer, the Double IHF World Juniors. Frank, the next time uh, you're around, you're going to have to play uh, croquet. Trust me, it'll be a game changer for you. Game. Yeah, I'll changer. try it. I'll try yeah. anything. Oh, well, the anything let, involving be beers and yeah, hanging exactly. out. Exactly. You're there. having beers and a competition. Like, it's not uh, like there's uh, like, are you thinking of cricket? Nope. Instead of I'm croquet. Of okay. Croquet, lawn, tennis. No, I don't know. Whatever. Cro- like, like, it's got the white sticks. little, you've, you've yeah, got the you, hard balls. It's like basically like a hard ball and the mallet. And it's like, yeah, and you got to hit it through the, uh, yeah, kicking the little a field goal almost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, you got to put it on the ground right through. I know, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I know the game. I just, no one here, I've never seen anyone like casually play it. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I don't know. There's, try, I, there's, there's a lot of different games that people play on the beach the can jam, the, I don't know, there's a whole slew of stuff. Um, I just a pretty easy going cornhole guy. All right. All right. You were leading okay. me down a weird path, though. You're like, you can step on the other guy's ball. <laughs> like, I was just like, what the fuck? What is happening right now? Oh, buddy, that's the greatest part about it. It's the, the whole strategy. Because everybody has their buddy who just, when they play games, they get so competitive. Right? Everybody has that friend or two that just, and you can rattle them in this game so easily. Especially when you play it in a big field and you just pump their ball way out of play. It's awesome. Oh, hump their ball. They're like, stop talking about it. You're killing it. <laughs> Get your mind out of the gutter. Oh. Jeez. Jeez. Well, Frank, this, uh, we're going to take uh, a few weeks off in July. We'll be back in August for more of the DFO rundown. So uh, th- now, unless of course it's a big breaking story, then we might connect for a bit. Even but, then um, I'm out of office. The- thanks everybody yeah. for, uh, for listening to the pod. We always uh, appreciate it. Big shout out to our buddy, Jay Onright, who uh, tweeted out. It's his favorite pod. So uh, thanks to uh, Jay Onright. Uh, from TSN. Thanks We're to everyone listening. What a year one it was at Daily Face Off and following us al- along with us. Uh, online pods, the show, uh, it was great having everyone on board and can't wait to see what we cook up for year two. Yeah. And uh, I just, for, as you see behind me, Frank, I'm in the midst of a uh, renovation. So uh, when we return, uh, my shell should be full. You will have a proper looking set for the first time. Yeah, that's right. Nah, nah, I'd like to, you know what? I do miss my. Uh, I do miss my Muhammad Ali and Maurice Richard pictures in the background. You're going to miss me too, or not. (laughs) All right. Have yourself a great one. Thanks, everyone, for uh, listening. Enjoy the the rest of the free agent frenzy. Uh, We're wrapping this up at uh, 940 Eastern on a Wednesday night. Uh, Ryan Strome's the latest signing for us. Five times uh, Kadri. For fun, Frank, where's he going before you leave? Where's he going? Kadri? Uh, I think he's going back to Colorado. That's kind of what I think too, maybe, but... Uh, I do. I do wonder if Calgary will try to strike because, man, they just lost a hundred and fifteen point player. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm tired of thinking about all that. Have a great summer, everyone. Thanks for listening to the DFO Rundown with Saravali and Gregor. Keep it locked on DailyFaceOff.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode. Delivered by DoorDash.